Gaming's Gamers Man Lev here with your Gamer Goggles, Gamer-Goggles.com, and today we're going to take a look at the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. And this is actually really important. After taking a real quick look through this book, it's not a true campaign setting book. Many of my friends are calling it a campaign setting book. And if you pick this book up and expect it to be a campaign setting book, I believe you're going to be upset. It's an adventurer's guide. To me, adventurers are characters that are played by players. So this is a guide for players to aid them in their quest on Sword Coast. Now, let's put this in perspective as to why it's not a true campaign setting book. Uh, you have Sword Coast, which is, with the history of Dungeons and Dragons, a legendary storyline area. It's iconic in... It's really kind of a realm within a realm. That's the way it's grown and matured. You've got things like Waterdeep in here. You've got the Harpers. You've got um, um, the Sea of Swords. All these great things. Waterdeep, Sword Mountain, um, Neverwinter Woods. You know, you got all this stuff that has been such a rich part of the Dungeons and Dragons storyline forever. Uh, so, the first two chapters really go through and present a lot of things for the players, like the, it goes in depth on the religion of Sword Coast and the different deities. It goes through the uh, different factions, the Harpers, the, um, there's a better list back here by Faction Agent, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, um different people. It goes through Neverwinter, it goes through Waterdeep. Now, if you have been playing as long as I have been playing, uh, you might find things like the information on Baldur's Gate and Walder, Wat, Waterdeep to be a little bit less than what you would expect. But, with that said, keep in mind that in the past, Baldur's Gate and Waterdeep have been their own boxed sets. They have been to some, you know, to some level, they have been their own online video games. I mean, Baldur's Gate was a huge video game when I was growing up. Actually, they just re-released it not too long ago uh, with uh, new new material. And so, now, about half of the book is information that is truly derived or designed to be for the players uh, about the different factions, about the different cities, which I guess technically that information is for the Dungeon Master as well. I guess I still call them a Dungeon Master. Um, but when you get to chapter two, or chapter three, my bad, you start getting into races, which races is where the book starts to get meaty for me, uh, because it's newer stuff. It's not all new. I mean, some of the stuff probably could have been in, uh, the rise of the underdark or... Um, like the Durgar, but the Durgar are your first effectively new race, um, and basically, you know, they, they're, they're a new way to build your dwarf. So you get superior dark vision, um, you get an extra language, you get the, the resilience, and you get your, your magic and your sunlight sensitivity. Now elves, uh, they get a little bit of stuff on moon elves, but they don't give them the uh, stat block for Moon Elves or for Sun Elves. You know, they go uh, over rare elf sub races. Um, they talk about the Dark Elves, which are touched upon in a previous book. And then you move into Halflings and you move through. There's not uh, too many... I mean, there, there's a lot of information here about different subtypes of... of the different races, but there's not too many new stat blocks within the book. Like, uh, you get the uh, Silver Neblin sub-race traits. There's not too many sub-race traits is where I was going. Uh, and then chapter four, though. This is, for me, this was the best chapter of the book. It, it introduces uh, Primal Paths, which you have a Primal Path of the Battle Rager, which is literally uh, translates as Axe Idiot, um, oh, and, of course, my favorite picture is here. Um, 
But what's cool, in my opinion, about this restriction is it's for dwarves only. They do get, uh, when you choose Battle Rager, um, when you choose this path, you, at third level you gain the ability to use spiked armor uh, and things like that. You get Reckless Abandon. Uh, but the, the one that I thought was cool was Spiked Retribution. Uh, at 14th level, uh, when creatures are within 5 feet, hits you in a melee attack, the attacker takes 3 piercing damage if you're raging. Uh, so basically you're going so crazy that if they try and hit you, they hurt themselves. Um, and then of course there's the Path of the Totem Spirit, which if you follow the Path of the Totem Warrior from the Player's Handbook, you have access to these options as well. And they do that, that's a recurring theme throughout this uh, chapter. Um, the Bardic Colleges set things up that are already in use in the Player's Handbook. For example, the College of uh, Volchlukan. Uh, you come down here, most bards study the practice of the methods of the College of Lore as described in the Bardic College class featured in the Player's Handbook. The College of Volchlukan um, naturally allied with the Harpers, although Master Bard careful to stress its mission. So it gives you more uh, flavor for your Bardic style of characters. And they do this all the way, they do this throughout. Um, they added new musical instruments, uh, you know, for the equipment section. Oops, we'll, go, we'll move over here. Like they got bird pipes, glower, hand drums, and so forth. Uh, they do add a domain of uh, for clerics. It's the Arcana domain, and basically it adds new spells. Uh, well, the cleric spells. Here you go. Uh, you have first level detect magic, magic missile, dispel magic, magic circle, arcane eye, which is really a super cool spell. Um, But after that, you move into like things like fighters. They they now have the martial archetype, which is an archetype option you can choose in addition to those in the player's handbook. Uh, Purple Dragon Knight, which basically these guys have restrictions on their knighthood um, to a specific order. Of course, you can be a royal envoy. You can have rally and cry. And Paladins, uh, they have some really cool stuff for the Paladins. They have the, which one is it? Some of these Paladins already use oaths that are in the player's handbook, like the Paladin of the Order of the Companion will use, uh, the Sacred Oath class feature, the Oath of the Crown, described below. And the Oath of Devotion, described in the Player's Handbook. So the Oath of the Crown has the tenets of law, loyalty, courage, and responsibility. And then they have the Oath Spells. Uh, at third level, you get to channel Divinity. They have the Champion's Challenge. And they have Turn the Tide, which Turn the Tide is cool as a bonus action. You basically bolster creatures uh, with your channel divinity. And each creature of your choice that you can hear within 30 feet regains 1d6 hit points. So basically, you kind of do a, a, a lay on hands that heals for 30 feet. Uh, which is really cool. Um, oh, 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 favorite picture, I lied, it's Drizzt and his panther, which by the way, if you guys haven't, uh, didn't know, you can pick up Drizzt, uh, this guy is just primed and not painted yet, uh, from Gale Force 9. And then, they have different sorcerer origins, uh, like Windspeaker, Windspeaker, uh, the arcane magic you command is infused with elemental air. Who would have figured, right? Uh, but your last chapter of the book is New Backgrounds, City Watch, Clan Crafter. My favorite is the Faction Agent, which uh, many organizations 
basically have spies. Uh, for example, the organizations are really factions like the Harpers, Order of the Gauntlet, and the Emerald Enclave. Uh, so, what do you get from this? Well, you get new skills. Well, you don't get new skills. They're not new. You get, you gain insight and intelligence wisdom, and one intelligence wisdom or charisma skill of your choice as appropriate to your faction. Uh, and then you get two languages, plus your badge or emblem of a faction copy or semi um, seminal faction text or code book or whatever. Wh whatever fits your character's faction. Uh, plus, you know, your feature is that you, you gain safe ha haven from uh, supporters of your, your group. And, of course, then you have some suggested characteristics like... Uh, You might take terms like, uh, they give you some advice for playing it. For instance, consider the words faith and faction to be interchangeable. So you use tables for the Kyleite backgrounds in the player's handbook and make them fit your group. Uh, but I really like the, I just like the flavor that that gives you. Another one that is interesting is Far Traveler. You could be a race that doesn't really fit in in Sword Coast. And they have, uh, all, there's actually quite a bit of detail here. Um, on the different things that could be going on with your character. That's one of the bigger uh, traits that they, or backgrounds that they introduce in this chapter. Um, th I think that the backgrounds really add a lot to the D&D 5th Ed game world, and it'd be silly that uh, you can't use them. They do add things like the Urban Bounty Hunter and the Uthgar Tribe Member, which Uthgar Tribe Member gives you athletic survival, uh, musical instrument, and basically a hunting trap. Plus, uh, your feature is you you have excellent knowledge, uh, not only for your tribe's territory, but any terrain and natural resources in all of the north. And then you move into the appendix, which in the appendix, they talk about things like using uh, different class features in Dragonlance, uh, Eberron, and in your own home worlds, and then after that, they have an index. So, what do I think of Sword Coast? Well, for me, it, it was a little light on the uh, material, but I've been playing Dungeons & Dragons for a long, long time. Uh, it's, I think, the right amount of meat for adventurers or players, especially if they're newer players. And I think it's a good reference or a good starting point to make some really rich NPCs for a TM. Um, with that said, I like the book uh, at this point. So come back in a week or two and read my full written review and see if I've changed my mind after I read through the book again. Thanks for watching. This has been a flip through with Matt Lemke from Through Gamer Goggles, gamer-goggles.com. Please check out our Kickstarter in the next couple weeks uh, for Season 5. We're looking to do a lot more things, especially role-playing based. I want my role-play ramblings to kind of take off and I really, really kind of want to do something with uh, world building next year. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good day. We really can't be here uh, without your support on Kickstarter.